Thank you very much for um, that very kind introduction and thank you for the invitation. Apologies to my Swedish friends for taking so long uh, to get here. It's a very long planned visit, but it, uh, it's a delayed one. But uh, in the end, I think I came at a lovely time um, of the year in Sweden. And since it's Friday and uh, June, I thought I would begin um, by offering three reasons not to bother about climate change. If you're convinced by any of these reasons, then you can leave early and uh, enjoy the Swedish summer. If you find, as I do, these reasons as unconvincing, then uh, please stay and we'll discuss um, what the costs and damages are of um, climate change, what the risks are, how you evaluate them, and then what for me is perhaps the most interesting part of the story, what do you actually do, how do you put uh, policy uh, together. Um, so let's start with three reasons why you shouldn't bother. Well, the first reason is that the science is all wrong. That in the words of the previous occupant of um, the chair of the Senate Environment Committee, that this is all a great scientific hoax. Now, I'm not a scientist. Um, many of the people who believe it's a hoax are not scientists either. Some of them who believe it's a hoax are scientists, but they're very, very few relative to the overall body of serious science. I think the way in which the scientific evidence is built up, um, as the permanent secretary of the, of the academy underlined, as is uh, embodied in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, the way in which that science is built up, I think now we have to regard the evidence as overwhelming. It's very old science in the sense that the idea that the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere could catch uh, the infrared energy and prevent it from uh, leaving the Earth, that is very old science. It's 19th century science, and indeed one of the leading people in the 19th century to work that out was Arrhenius here in, uh, in Sweden. So the basic idea is an old one, and it's been refined and developed, and the observations now have started to build up uh, very strongly. I think in the weight of all this uh, evidence, to deny the science is now absurd. And I am not a scientist. I did do a degree in maths and physics about 40 years ago, but we did not try to second-guess the science. What we've been trying to do is to use the science to help us understand some of the risks that we run. And the science has, in the last few years, been particularly helpful in giving us new insights into that because it has started to talk in terms of probability distributions. And once you do that, you help economists and others look at uh, the policy towards risk in a much more serious way. The second thing, uh, way of denying the importance of all this is to say that humans are fantastically adaptable and whatever comes their way they will adapt to it. Um, that's not a completely empty statement. We will indeed have to adapt to climate change. Uh, we're already seeing some of its effects, and we're going to see some more because of what's happened in the past. Adaptation is crucial to this whole story. London will have uh, wetter winters, and we will have to invest a great deal in the London sewage systems to um, uh, sort that out. Now, that's just one example of one area in one city in one rich country. I choose the example because I was born and brought up and live in London and take it rather seriously. But there are, of course, many other parts of the world where the impacts could be much bigger than that. I think what we now know in terms of the risks that could happen, risks of, under business as usual, five, six, seven degrees centigrade increases relative to pre-industrial times, we now know that those risks are potentially of enormous consequence. Um, five degrees centigrade is the difference between now and the last ice age, 10 or 12,000 years ago. At that time, uh, much of uh, Canada, Northern America, Sweden, Northern Europe, and so on, was under a mile of ice. That is earth transforming. What we do know is temperature differences of that kind are earth transforming. We don't know exactly what the consequence will be, but I think we can uh, see that there's a real risk that they might be very big. So the statement that we can adapt to whatever comes our way, given the risk of these kinds of magnitude of changes, has to now be regarded as reckless. 
We could all migrate upwards and live near the North Pole, but think of the consequences that would uh, result from that in terms of disruption and conflict and so on. These are very big risks indeed. So to say that we can adapt to whatever comes our way uh, and imply that that's somehow straightforward or easy, I think has to be regarded as reckless. A third way of um, denying the importance of all this is to say, well, you know, the, this, all, this, all these effects are a long way into the future. Nothing much that we can do now can affect the next 30, 40, 50 years. This is all about action now for results 100, 150 years from now. And we don't care about the future. Uh, I'm just not bothered. I mean, the future is sometime in the future, and I don't care. This is not something to do with inequality, that they might be richer or poorer or whatever. That's a different kind of argument. But simply that we just don't care about the future. And I think that we have to regard that argument as unethical. So you deny the science and be absurd, say that we can adapt to whatever and be reckless and disregard the future, and I think we have to regard that as unethical. But, you know, you're free to take your choice, your view on the science, your view on adaptation, and your view on the ethics. It's up to you. But I think most people, when looking at the evidence now and thinking hard about what's involved, the risks and the ethics, I think will come to a conclusion that strong and urgent action does make sense. So the first part, the first half of the review is looking at the costs of action and the costs of inaction and thinking about how you compare them the cost of inaction in terms of the risks, the cost of action in terms of the kinds of investments that you should make, and trying to compare them. That's the first half of the review. The second half of the review is on policy, how you put policy together, what are the principles for policy, what are the practical, practicalities of policy, particularly when this is a, a challenge of international um, action where we have to move together. What we tried to do in the review, which I think was a bit different, not totally different because we're building on what went before, but a bit different from what went before in economics, is to bring risk and uncertainty to the centre stage. We were able to do that because of the advances in the science. And secondly, to try to make the ethics transparent and out into the open so that we can have a serious discussion of the ethical issues. We did that. Um, the ethics and the uh, risk and uncertainty, looking at the uh, costs of action and inaction. The policy towards risk and the ethics, of course, come very much into the overall policy towards climate change. So the ethics and the risk come very strongly into the policy part of the discussion as well. Um, but we lay, in addition, in the policy part, special emphasis on international collective action. So let me move pretty rapidly into uh, the story. We haven't got a lot of time. It's uh, 700 pages, and I've got about uh, 20 slides. So it's one slide for 35 pages on average. It's going to be a pretty uh, uh, broad brush story that I'll try to tell. But there is the report itself, and there have been uh, articles in World Economics and uh, in other publications, in the toing and froing of the discussion, which should take place and is taking place. So I'll have to refer you to those, the pub review itself, publications in the world, economics and so on, for uh, detailed references on what I want to say. Now, first, let's note very quickly that there's a whole area of economics on market failure associated with uh, externalities, and this is built on that kind of analysis. Um, a market failure.